If you vacationed in a snowy mountain cabin and Nazi zombies try to kill you, what would you do? In this How to Beat video, we'll follow the Norwegian students, see if we can make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the Nazi zombies in dead snow. If you think you could do better than me, let us know in the comments. If you like these How to Beat videos, consider liking and subscribing. This video's sponsor is Raid Shadow Legends. Before you click my link, download Raid for free on your mobile phone or PC and ape into some boss battles or PvP duels with the millions of other players, you need to check out the new faction called Shadowkin. The Shadowkin had vanished for hundreds of years, until now. They are heavily inspired by the mythos of medieval Japan and Eastern Asia. We're talking samurais, ninjas, onis, and a host of other mythical badasses. Yoshi the Drunkard is going to be at the top of the food chain very literally. This booze bag specializes in drunk fighting. The only champ that might one-up him is Torgi the Frog with his own brew of toxic bodily fluids. It's said that a samurai's soul resides in its katana, not Chintoro. His katana imbibes the blood of his defeated enemies, capturing their souls forever. Soul-sucking katanas are cool and all, but it's no substitute for just clobbering your enemies into a pulp with blood masks death mace. It's Raid's two-year anniversary, so there's loads of events tournaments, free gifts, and rewards going on until the middle of April. You might also be able to get involved in the very first ever clan vs clan tournament and get a chance to compete directly against another clan. On top of that, they've got some huge updates coming later in the month, including a new Doom Tower rotation with two new bosses. Get a head start in Raid by clicking the link in the description or scanning my QR code, and you'll get your free epic champion, Yotun, who you can use to tear down the Doom Tower. 100,000 silver, 50 gems, and three ancient shards you can use to summon and awesome champions. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. Rewards will be available only for the next 30 days and only for new players. Let's get to it. After witnessing a random woman run down and eaten by zombies that were suspiciously wearing Nazi SS uniforms, we start following seven students vacationing in a cabin in the woods. In the car, Roy tells him about a man in the newspaper who was buried in an avalanche and was later found to have accidentally dug six yards deeper into the snow because he was disoriented. Vagar's pro tip is to just spit and then dig in the opposite direction, gravity pulls your saliva. Apparently this is something he learned in his military service. I thought it was just common knowledge or common sense. How this man dug six yards deep without realizing he should have been falling back down is one of the most idiotic things I've heard all week. It's not going to be a sausage party after all. They got some ladies coming too. There's mention of a Sarah who was going to hike into the cabin on her own. If that Sarah was in the pre Lude, they're going to be coming up one short. The cabin they're staying at is a 45 minute walk off the road. Only Vagar knows the way in and out, so the rest will have to follow his snowmobile tracks. He could have ferried them to the cabin, but that would just get in the way of doing some sick triple X moves. I'm sure he never comes up here and it's rarely ever used, but it wouldn't be hard to pin some red markers on the trees to mark the route so others could get in and out if needed. Or if someone got hurt and emergency services needed to find them. Not only is the route unmarked, but there's no cell signal. Elon Musk really needs to get that Starlink set up so people getting attacked by things in Antarctica and Nazi zombies in the Norwegian Alps can call for help. Movie cliches aside, being in remote areas with no ability to call for help and no way of anyone finding you quickly is actually a risky thing in real life. Just because it's a movie cliche doesn't make it less dangerous. <laughs> Man, how many movies are there where some psycho is stalking you with a knife in their hand? That guy following us is so cliche, am I right? Well, I feel attacked. The group burns the rest of the daylight off, tubing, grilling wieners, and playing Twister until eventually someone has to use the outdoor laboratory. Nothing good ever comes from using an outhouse at night in the dark freezing woods. At minimum, it's freezing and uncomfortable. But worst case, you're alone in a vulnerable position and your enemies can take you completely by surprise. Not Liv, though. She gets that weird subconscious feeling of being watched, like something's off. Like anyone would do, she runs back inside yelling about seeing a man outside. Of course, everyone tries to come up with reasonable explanations like it being Sarah or a moose, which has to be infuriating. Knowing you saw something, but your friends just think you saw a rabbit or the shadow of snow falling off the trees. That or they look out of a musty window and say, Sick of that. Yeah, no sh 
that you didn't see anyone standing in plain view of the window. If there was someone out there, they'd be operating in the darkness of the tree line or in the house's blind spots. With Liv being freaked out about seeing someone outside, they should probably start using the buddy system if anyone else needs to use the porta potty tonight, or at least slow down on the booze. I also hope there's an old hunting rifle stashed away in a closet because they don't have much in the way of weapons if an axe murderer all of a sudden busts in swinging. Like a true alpha male, Roy needlessly puts himself in harm's way to prove there isn't any danger. He gets lucky that the man who snuck up behind him was only looking for a cup of joe. This dude is completely killing the vibe they had going, but if we're going with the whole movie cliche thing, he's definitely the strange old man that's going to start dropping history lessons about some old evil that's lurking around these parts. It'd probably be wise to pay attention. So go flera soldater om man klart att flykta. Den står upp i fjällen. I de fjällen här. Den ondskapen. If what this guy said is true, why would he be traveling outside in these parts by himself, unarmed? And why would he willingly leave the relative safety of the cabin? I'd be suspicious of this guy, not the tall tail he's spitting. Everyone but Liv is disregarding this as senile rambling. And even then, she's probably thinking that what she saw in the tree line earlier was the old man himself. Sarah hasn't shown up yet, but Vagar did say that she might be arriving in the morning. As far as they're concerned, there's nothing to worry about. Before the Wanderer leaves, Roy makes another smartass remark that he doesn't take too kindly to. Whether his story is true or not, the fact that this guy is roaming around would be scary enough to want to watch your back from here on out. Naturally, all the disturbing shit the old man was talking about seeped into their minds and propagated into their dreams. What the fuck, brain? Thanks for the visual of my missing girlfriend dying and puking black blood. I really needed that after being told that there might be undead Nazi zombies lurking in these mountains with my girlfriend hiking in by herself. I will say, going hiking through somewhat treacherous terrain by yourself with no cell signal wasn't too smart, but I'm sure she's fine and this was just a case of an overactive imagination. Really, what is this guy even doing out here? He doesn't look like a hunter to me. Maybe he's not simply a hunter, maybe he's a ghost hunter, or whatever the Nazi zombie equivalent of a ghost hunter is. Oh, I know, this guy is like the amateur Norwegian version of the hunting Hitler crew. He's no Tim Kennedy though. I don't want to put words in Tim Kennedy's mouth, but I doubt he would have trekked out into the heart of these evil mountains by himself, having only brought a bolt action rifle and a narrow beam flashlight, and then set up in the middle of the open in a tent lit up like a Christmas tree. That would be the sound of your bad decisions catching up to you. We already know this guy massively f***ed up coming here at night, and by willingly leaving the cabin to camp in a tent. But let's just rip through him some more. He should have brought a camping lantern which lights up over 30 meters in all directions. His narrow beam flashlight is next to useless, and coupled with a bolt action rifle, acquiring, engaging, reloading, reacquiring, and re-engaging is going to be absurdly difficult. If what he said is true, there could be hundreds of undead Einsatz commandos out here. Impossible odds. Even if he was a regular camper or hunter who was only concerned about dangerous animals and didn't actually believe his own stories, he was still poorly equipped. He basically committed suicide. The nightmare, what the old guy said, Sarah still not here in the morning, all stoke Vagar into going on a search and rescue mission to try to find her. This is a mistake. He should ride back into town to contact the police who will notify the Norwegian search and rescue service. The SAR team is vastly more well manned, equipped, and trained for the job. Vagar going after Sarah by himself without any real training or equipment is not only dangerous, but he's also much less likely to find her, or be able to effectively rescue her if he does. On his way he finds the wanderer's tent, and inside, his mutilated corpse. Seeing as there's bloody footprints walking away from the scene, this was no animal. I know they're evil Nazi zombies and all, but leaving behind a crime scene is not going to do them any favors. They have a leader, are somewhat intelligent, and according to the legends, they fled into these mountains to hide at the end of the war. Covering their tracks should be a strat residing in their decaying brain matter. Stupid Nazis. Now, as Vagar do you keep snowmobiles? 
wheeling around the mountainside searching for Sarah with a murdering psycho on the loose? Or do you head back and get off the mountain with the rest of your friends so you can go get help from people who actually know what the f*** they're doing? I'm gonna go with the latter. For some reason, Vagar thinks this is a movie and he's the hero and decides to follow the murderer's foot tracks. It's not a good sign when you're resorting to tracking down a murderer to find your missing girlfriend, but it's the best lead he has. maybe undertaking the rescue operation by yourself wasn't such a good idea. Back at the lodge, the group discovers a box full of old gold and jewelry dated with the year 1942. No bells are ringing that this might be related to the World War II Einsatz group confiscations the Wanderer was talking about. Not that it would change anything if it had. There's no way they could anticipate that undead Nazis will rise out of their icy graves and shank them for f***ing with their loot. To them, it's old junk they could pawn off to pay for their student loans, which I'm sure is triggering to any historians out there. While everyone's playing with the cursed jewelry, Hannah slips one of the coins into Martin's joggers without him knowing. Why wouldn't she just put it in her own pocket if she wanted to take one? I don't get it. Liv seeing someone in the woods, the creepy old man sneaking up on them and choking out Roy, and Vagar not being back yet hasn't unnerved them one bit. They're all wasted and not using a buddy system when visiting the outhouse at night. Sure, you'd most likely get called a bitch by the other guys for suggesting you tag team the toilet it with your bro, but I think it's reasonable given the circumstances. In the Navy SEAL Buds training, you get assigned a swim buddy that you can't be further than three feet from the whole six months, because they get that when you're alone, you're weak and vulnerable, especially when on the john. Damn, Chris is a freak, Jesus Christ. Not exactly what I meant with the buddy system, but it'll do. Erland heads back to the cabin to run a victory lap while Chris finishes up on her own, or so she thinks. When she goes for the TP, she catches a peeping Tom, or more technically, a peeping undead Nazi SS paramilitary death squad soldier. The most surprising thing is her lack of blood-curdling screams. Not that it would help, but the rest of the group smashing beers and blasting music. There's not much she can do at this point. <laughs> What do you know? There was a gun in this old cabin. Hope there's ammo around and it's not just for decoration. Hannah tosses Martin the pump trench gun and the boys head out looking for Chris. Their investigation comes up empty, which I find hard to believe. How did Chris get pulled through the toilet hole without breaking anything? And how was there blood not all over the snow leading up to the house? The guys seem to think that them not finding Chris means that everything is chill. I think that it would be even more alarming, especially since they also found Sarah's backpack. The situation escalates when Hannah takes a peek outside and sees Chris's head being waved around by a homicidal maniac. Nazi zombies sure do have a sick sense of humor. Liv then makes the almost fatal, also cliche, mistake of having her back next to that same window. Cutting Liv's hair with a knife to free her was a clutch move, good thinking. Barricading the windows and doors is also good, but everyone needs to start finding things they can use for shields and weapons. One of them should look around to try to find spare ammo for their shotgun since it's the best weapon they have. I doubt there is any, so Marta needs to be sparing with it and only shoot when he sees the whites of their undead eyes. Once all the entrances are sufficiently barricaded up, everyone needs to huddle in the middle to one, avoid getting grabbed like Liv, and two, so that Martin has a clear shot. Beyond that, there's not much to do but hold out until morning. I've never heard of Nazi vampires, so the sunlight can't be relied upon to vaporize them. But Vagar might be back with a snowmobile, they'd have better visibility, and more people would be awake that could potentially help them. Whatever is attacking them, it likely does not want to be spotted in broad daylight. <laughs> Now it's clear they're dealing with zombies, and judging by the decayed hand with the Einsatz ring, the Nazi variety. Erland, having watched his fair share of movies, starts freaking out and yelling at everyone not to get bitten. Hey, that's my job! In my opinion, based on what the Wanderer Man said, this is looking a lot more like an evil curse and not a virus. Not that you'd want to get bitten by a Nazi zombie. Zombies are just a breeding ground for bacteria and infectious diseases. Hannah thinks they should run for the car, which is a total joke. 
joke. There's no way they can make it trudging for 45 minutes through the snow at night while being attacked when they don't even know the way out without Vagar. Besides that automatic fail, they also have no idea how many of them are actually out there. It's dark as hell and they have no flashlights. The shotgun doesn't have enough ammo and Martin does not have the training to operate it under duress. And they're all boozed up, unarmed, and out of shape. Good thing Hannah's not team lead because that would have been a total massacre. Erlen makes the same mistake as Liv by standing too close to the window, but he's not as lucky as she was. Running to the car is out of the question. This zombie just pulled his head apart like it was a watermelon. That's like Game of Thrones mountain levels of strength. And there's tons of these freaks out there. They just need to hold out till morning. To be honest, I'm somewhat shocked that they survived the night. Colonel Herzog is a dipshit. No wonder they lost the war. All they needed to do is Molotov the cabin and smoke them out. Or toss one of their stick grenades in through a window to stun them before charging in and ripping their guts out. I honestly never thought I'd have a job which entailed helping Nazi zombies kill innocent civilians. Dreams really do come true. With snowfall covering the snowmobile tracks and obscuring the path back to civilization, they plan to split up. The gals will make a run for where they think is town, while Martin and Roy create a diversion to buy them some time. If only someone marked the route. Not that it would help much if the Nazi things decided to hunt them in broad daylight, but it would have given them a sliver of a chance. Thinking about it, they weren't blindfolded for the 45 minute walk in. They should have at least a general sense of direction of where they came from. The distraction idea is also flawed. Creating a diversion only works if you know where the Nazis are located. Liv and Hannah could easily be running right towards the zombies, in which case Martin and Roy banging on pots and pans is not going to help. Their best option is to stay together, grab weapons from the shed and haul ass in the general direction they came in while daylight's on their side. Damn, Vagar was unconscious for like 12 hours. Must have really jacked his head on something. Looks like some sort of tunnel network. Could it be the old man was not lying? Using a stick and some gas from his snowmobile, he fashions a makeshift torch to go tomb raiding. The open graves, the Nazi flags, machine guns, grenades, helmets. Yeah, the old dude was not lying. Vagar needs to grab that MP40 before he runs into whatever's down here. It's not reasonable for Vagar to jump to conclusions and think he's dealing with Nazi zombies, but it could be another Hero Onada situation, where some old ass Nazis held out and survived in these tunnels this whole time by mugging and murdering the occasional hiker. Honestly, the Norwegians should have hunted them down after World War II. Why would you let a group of genocidal maniacs roam free miles from your town? Vagar eventually finds Sarah's head on display as some sort of sick trophy. As heart-stopping as this revelation is, there's no time to grieve in the devil's lair. Not to help the Nazis again, but if they still have functioning firearms, why aren't they using them? Odd that they'd want to use knives with the historical precedent of mowing down millions of innocent people with rifles. Using his military training and the fire of vengeance ignited from Sarah's death, Vagar beats the zombie down with its own helmet. The Norwegian military apparently doesn't train to double tap their downed enemies. It's an undead monster, you can't expect it to be fully dead from knocking its head around a bit. His victory is short lived with another undead Nazi climbing out of the snow next to him. Yeah, it's time to run back to the snowmobile and triple X your ass back to base. Who knows how many of them are buried in these tunnels. The Nazis corner him before he can get to his snowmobile, so he's forced to face them head on. Defeating them is surprisingly easy. The problem with Nazi zombies is that their brains have decayed to the point where they turn into shitty movie villains who throw their enemies towards weapons that can be used against them. That was basically a layup for Vagar. The throwing knife to the face was a pro move, especially considering he's cold, exhausted from fighting, wearing thick gloves on an uneven snowy hillside, and stressed from being under attack by undead Nazis. I've thrown axes before, and it's a lot harder than it looks. I personally would not have done that because I'd have f***ed it up and ended up just giving it the knife. He gets tackled off a cliff, but manages to grab onto the other zombies' intestines, Tarantino style. <laughs> Oh, 
hopefully I'm right about this being an evil curse thing and not an infectious zombie virus thing because there's a lot of bodily fluids being exchanged. He headbutts the zombie off, climbs back up, and performs some extreme field surgery by stitching his carotid artery closed with a fishing line and hook using his snowmobile's mirror. Hell of a day. I don't think it's possible to stitch a chewed open carotid artery closed in the field like that. The duct tape around his neck might help a bit, but it's just a matter of time before he bleeds out. He needs to get to a hospital ASAP if he has any chance of surviving. Vagar knows his friends must also be under attack and that nobody would believe him if he went for help, so rather than save himself, he mounts a confiscated belt-fed MG34 on his snowmobile and prepares for war. There's still that MP40 and possibly more guns, grenades, and ammo that he should have stocked up on but doesn't. Crucial mistake. When he fires her up for one last ride, another Barry Nazi smells the fresh blood and thinks it's his moment to shine. The zombie catching a face full of tree branch was lucky. This is also why he should have brought that submachine gun. The MG34 is not really made for blasting people off your snow boots. As expected, the diversion was a total failure. Hannah's putting in work though. That's the other thing about zombies. Their bodies have decayed so much that their heads pop like water balloons when you stomp on them. Even though it's easier to kill them than expected, they really should have grabbed knives or something from the tool shed to defend themselves with. Liv is not doing as well. Getting cannibalized by the undead SS and all. The Nazis are too preoccupied indulging on her tasty flesh to notice that she swiped one of their potato mashers. By the time they do, the four and a half second fuse is already burnt through. I'm a bit surprised Liv knew how to detonate the grenade. World War II stick grenades are not as intuitive as modern ones where most people know how to pull the pin and let the lever fly. With stick nades, you have to unscrew the inconspicuous looking bottom cap and then pull the string that comes out. Hannah hides in a tree, which somehow works. These Nazis must be blind to not see her when she's wearing a giant puffy red coat. Hannah really should have taken that off think being cold is a little better than being dead. She accidentally climbs up next to a bird's nest, causing Mama Crow to get pissed and start cawing loudly. By the time she chokes it out, the zombies already found her. The tree isn't the greatest hiding spot because you're basically trapped if you get caught. That and your footprints in the snow will obviously lead to a tree and then suddenly stop. Hannah had no idea where she was going and was exhausted by this point, so the tree probably looked like her only option. She does, however, have the high ground. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! and expertly uses it to perform a Super Smash Bros. Link drop sword maneuver. I can't say I would have thought to do that. She accidentally backs herself into another corner and knowing she can't take it on 1v1, takes it with her off the glyph. There must have been a thick layer of pow to cushion that fall. According to physics.stack exchange, falling at terminal velocity into 15 to 20 feet of snow should be survivable. I wouldn't try to home though. The problem with surviving a huge fall into snow is that you need to dig your broken ass back out. Hope she knows the spit trick. The zombie survived the fall too, but Hannah got out first, so she gets a free penalty kick to its head. The boys aren't doing so hot themselves. Roy does the Nazi's job for them by burning themselves out of the shelter with a poor poorly thrown Molotov. Martin then pulls out his Nokia and rings the cops. You're telling me you did have a cell signal this whole time. Why the f didn't you call the police when you first got attacked? He then takes this critical opportunity to start yelling at the cops that they're under attack by zombies in German World War II uniforms. And surprise, surprise, gets hung up on. Roy is right. If you're being attacked by Nazi zombies, don't say you're being attacked by Nazi zombies. The thing is, even if Martin told them a hiker had gone mad and attacked them and the police were ready to respond, he wouldn't have been able to give them his location because he doesn't know it. And even if he did, without route markers, finding this place will be difficult and take a while. It's also crazy to me that nobody had a paper map of this area. The Nazi zombies failed to secure the perimeter, so Roy and Martin are able to flee to the shed stocked with killing devices. An all-out war between the Norwegian students and the undead Nazis ensues, waged with crude instruments of farming and fieldwork. The undead get clobbered rather easily, almost too easily. Even though killing them isn't too difficult, more keep rising out of the snow. If you ventured into some of my random earlier videos I made, you'll notice one called, Your Heroes Will Die Tired. 
The point I tried to make is that hand-to-hand -hand fighting is extremely taxing and exhausting. Your average person, aka you, would be completely smoked and out of energy after a couple of hand-to-hand -hand bouts with the enemy, to the point where if another attacker came at you, it would be very easy for them to overpower and kill you. Roy and Martin have to be running on fumes. Just when all hope seems lost, Vagar flies in with the upgunned snowmobile and saws down a line of zombies. That should buy them enough time for Martin and Roy to get on the snowmobile and drive out of there. Instead, Vagar decides to pop a wheelie and decapitate another Nazi with its skis. The snowmobile gets pinned into a tree, so Vagar suplexes the next zombie, plants the snowmobile treads on its face, and opens the throttle. Jeez, I'm almost feeling sorry for them. Vagar would not have had to wreck his snowmobile if he had brought more ammo, guns, and grenades from the tunnels, or if he executed a hot extract for Roy and Martin and peaced out. Now they're unarmed and on foot with zombies popping out of the snow everywhere. Not good. <laughs> No! Vagar was a badass. Why'd they have to do my boy like that? Hina arrives at the party with a hatchet in her neck. Must have caught that on the way back. Looks like it's all come down to Roy and Martin. Martin unloads the trench gun into the SS zombies, but there's only five or so shells in it. Not enough to kill them all. One of the remaining SS zombies tackles him to the ground and bites his arm. Remembering what Erland said about the zombies and not getting bitten, he fires up the chainsaw to self-amputate his arm so as to not let the infection spread. Did he not just get zombie guts poured into his facial orifices? If this was a zombie virus thing, you're already infected. I still think it's more reasonable to assume the Nazi are undead due to a curse and not a virus, in which case there's no need to amputate. Even if you assume the worst case scenario that you contracted the zombie virus, chopping your arm off is a bullshit movie cliche and doesn't work at all. Blood pumps through your body extremely fast, and likewise so do pathogens. For example, drugs injected into your arm will reach your brain in a few seconds. Guess they didn't cover that in your med school, Martin. <laughs> His efforts, stupid yet commendable, are rendered obsolete when another zombie rises from the grave beneath his legs and sinks its teeth into his sack. Yeah, let's go with the evil curse thing. The movie cliche I would go with is that killing Herzog would end the curse, deading all the undead for good. If they want to live and end this thing, they need to kill him now before his backup arrives in force. Martin and Roy freeze up, lose their only opportunity, and are forced to run for it. Roy gets sideswiped by Erzog and his intestines get caught up on a tree. Not sure how that happened. Martin then looks back and sees Erzog grab some loot out of his pockets. It looks like he connected the dots with the Wanderer's story, that all this was over the confiscated valuables. Damn Nazi zombies, all you had to do was ask. This is the crux of the situation, or it's supposed to be. But I don't really think there was a point in the movie, besides when Martin saw Erzog take the loot out of Roy's pocket, that this was clear. And really, I don't think this mattered much at all. Sarah, the hiker, and Vagar were all attacked before anyone pulled out the box of confiscated goods. The undead Nazi curse seems more territorial in nature. Martin races back to the burnt down cabin and offers up the box of golden jewelry. Erzog accepts and reluctantly spares his life. The movie ends with Martin reaching his car, grabbing the keys out of his pocket, and realizing he was still in possession of one of the coins. Oh, fuck. That's why I always put the car in drive immediately after I get in, so if someone pops up on my driver's side window, I can just jam the pedal and peel out. It is understandable that Martin would not be in the headspace to do that, having had his entire reality take a hard left with all of his friends getting murdered by Nazi zombies. That and he was spared by Erzog, so how could things have gone down differently? Sarah really shouldn't have been hiking alone, but it wouldn't have mattered if she had a friend. Her death was inevitable. When Sarah didn't show up in the morning after the Wanderer told his tale, Vagar should have rode into town and gotten the help of the police and the Norwegian search and rescue team. I could see the rest of the friends staying at the cabin in the meantime in case Sarah did show up, but they wouldn't have been alone as the police and SAR teams would be scouring the mountains looking for her. With the night approaching and Sarah still gone, I think it would be reasonable to cancel the trip and head back into town. I can't imagine I'd want to drink beer and play Twister with my friend missing. If they changed course at this pivotal moment in their decision tree, none of them would have died, except for the wanderer who was out camping there like an idiot. If they did stay and Vagar went off looking for Sarah on his own, which I suppose could be reasonable, Erland and Chris's deaths were unavoidable. If
If Vagar had put up route markers, or they brought a map or retained a semblance of direction, it would be a 20 minute run to the car. Could they have made it? I think it's possible given the Nazi zombies were not that coordinated or hard to kill, especially if they all stayed together and got weapons from the shed. When Vagar arrived at the cabin and noticed it was empty, he would have rode back into town and made it to the hospital. Once they all got off the mountain and alerted the authorities, the military would have rolled in and closed Erzog's casket for good. All said and done, I think we could have beaten the Nazi zombies from dead snow. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't play dress up with jewelry stolen from innocent civilians that were murdered by Nazi paramilitary death squads.